Good morning. Good to be with you today as we continue in the study of Genesis. As you will recall, uh, uh, in chapters 2 and 3, things were good. Uh, the environment was good. Uh, God had put man uh, on earth. And in chapter 3, man fell. And in the fourth chapter, that was carried on when Cain murdered Abel. And in the fifth chapter, we see a continuation of uh, genealogy. And in the 32nd verse, we see that Noah was 500 years old. He became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth at that time. And then we move into the 6th and 7th chapter today where we're going to look at the judgment of God. Uh, from a great start, we see the uh, population increasing but becoming more corrupt. So in chapter 6, verse 1, when man began to increase in numbers on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. There's been quite a controversy as to exactly who these sons of God were, whether they were human, whether they were angels, but in any event, the offspring of this uh, union was not good. Uh, in verse 3, then the Lord said, My spirit will, con will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. Uh, a better translation, I think, would be corrupt. His days will be 120 years. So the implication is there that with the indwelling of the spirit, man lived longer. But God said that man was corrupt. And in verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. Uh, the Nephilim uh, were fallen. That, that's their definition. They were big and strong. Now we don't think that they were Goliath size uh, big, nine feet tall, or or six nine, but they were tall and they were strong and and they were fallen, and they were the heroes of old men of renown. And then in verse five it says, "The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become." and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That is a severe condemnation, and, and God is going to punish. Uh, in this instance, we are looking at the story of the flood, but this wickedness word uh, could be translated uh, more appropriately, violence, perhaps. Uh, we don't know what type of violence. We, we don't know exactly what it was, but the uh, Nephilim were apparently the, the source of this corruption. And if you'll remember when Joshua and Caleb entered into the Promised Land to scout them out. They saw men that were tall and strong and came back to report that they couldn't, they couldn't uh, inhabit the land. Well, this, these were the same people, these, these fallen people. Uh, but every inclination of the thoughts of his heart and only evil all the time so we see in this the setting for the story of the flood. And this brings 
to our attention another very troubling verse, and that is in verse 6. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. A, an omnipotent, all-knowing uh, God, uh, an omnipresent God, uh, says that the Lord was grieved. Was he sad over what he had done in chapters 2 and 3? He saw what he had made, and... and it was good. It was very good in man's case. Uh, does this mean that God made a mistake? That God uh, experienced human emotions? He was grieved. His heart was filled with pain when he saw how corrupt his creation had had become. And, and he said in verse 7, I my, as his heart was filled with pain, I will wipe out mankind who I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds in the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. So we see this human-like emotion in God a sovereign God. We also see that, that, that not only does man suffer, but also the creation suffers. Uh, the things the, that God created, the animals, the, the uh, trees, the flowers, I am grieved that I have made them. But now here is a moment of grace. When when God provides judgment, which he always does, if we are disobedient, uh, God will judge us. But in verse 8 it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. So here is this moment of grace. We see the judgment coming through the flood, but we see grace from God. And verse 9, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Interesting, isn't it, that in the midst of this corrupt earth, this corrupt mankind, that Noah, spoken of individually here, not including his sons, but perhaps so, but, but that among all this corruption, among all this violence, among all this pain that, that humanity was suffering and God was suffering, that Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless. He walked with God. Now, it doesn't mean sinless, but he walked with God. And notice how many times this word corrupt appears in this very short section of Scripture, beginning in verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. Again, we don't know what kind of violence that was. Uh, we left with Cain slewing Abel, murdered his brother. We don't know if that is what continued. But God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people of the earth had corrupted their ways. They had self-inflicted their corruption. They had, by their own choice, become corrupt. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So the earth suffers for man's sin. Now it's interesting to me uh, to look at this. I am surely going to destroy both them, 
speaking of mankind and the earth. We read nothing further about the earth being destroyed, and it wasn't. So it's an interesting uh, statement here by God in addition to his grieving and his heart being pained with man's corruption. In verse 14, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This word ark is only found twice in the New Testament in this section and then the uh, little basket that that Moses floated down the Nile in where his mother had placed him it was covered with pitch on the inside and out and this word ark is found only here and in that. Uh, Cypress wood is used, gopher wood is also uh, an interpretation, uh, cypress probably being better, but uh, nevertheless it was made of wood. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. So this is not like a ship that we would see with an angular front, and uh, it didn't have a rudder. It was more like a barge. It was... I would think rectangular so that that it just floated uh, according to the tide, according to God's plan. And it says, put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. So there are three floors, there are rooms in it, uh, but it's interesting that God put a door in the side. He said, no, put one door in the side. The only way to safety, to salvation, if you will, is through this door, just as in our case, the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ, through our faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. God provides judgment as he does for us in punishment for our sins, but he also provides grace, a method of salvation. In this case, it was the door to the ark. In our case, it is through uh, faith and following of Jesus. In verse 17, I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. So there is punishment. There is going to be a flood. And Noah is 500 years old. And it's never rained. He's never seen rain. He doesn't have an umbrella, and he has three boys, and God has told him to build this huge ark, 100,000 square feet, to hold all of the animals, uh, Noah and his three boys and their wives, but it hasn't even rained yet. And God is saying to Noah, build an ark. And Noah did all that God commanded. But I will establish my comfort covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Everything on the earth will perish, Noah, but you and your family will survive. In verse 19, 
You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you, two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive, will come to you. So Noah, you build the ark, you put the door on the side, and the animals will come to you. Obviously, fish are not mentioned because they'll do very well in the flood, I suspect. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground to, will come to you to be kept alive. So this includes the four-legged animals, the, the birds, the those that that uh, slither on the ground, snakes. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And I have thought as I have read this story of time and again that what would I do if if I was in Noah's spot and I was on dry land and I'd never seen rain um, and he said build an ark. Some of the things that that God has commanded his people to do have been by their view absurd yet God was always right and Noah did everything that God said to do. In verse 5, and Noah did all that God commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on earth. Now, he was 500 when he had his boys. And I wonder if it took 100 years to build this ark. And I certainly wouldn't doubt that it, it did. And then it says in verse 10 that after the seven days, the floodwaters came to the earth. Then if we jump over to verse 20, it says the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. It's all... It's been controversial, I guess, or it's been discussed in books ad infinitum as to whether or not this flood was a flood that covered the entire earth or whether this was a, a flood that just covered the region, just where Noah could see or just where he believed the population was. But as I read this, uh, I believe that that and the commentaries that I uh, looked at believe that this was a flood that flooded the entire earth, its totality. And the r waves rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, and wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all of the man and all mankind, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. The earth was purified, the earth was washed clean. Uh, similar to our entrance into the waters of baptism. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Man and animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. Now, even with this severe judgment, with the flood, with the, the, the wiping out of all mankind and all animals, 
God provided grace. He says in the first verse of chapter 9, Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and multiply. So with punishment, there is grace. With disobedience, there is punishment. But there is always God's grace. Praise God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day and for this lesson of the flood. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. Uh, Father, we thank you for this season that we recently celebrated the, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, our salvation. And just as the door to the ark provided safety for those that entered, so does Jesus offer safety and salvation and eternity for us as we enter the kingdom through him. Father, we pray for our church and we, we pray for those that lead it. We ask, Father, that you would be with those that are traveling as a result of this season or in the hospital or uh, suffering uh, financial or marital difficulties. Father, we pray your presence with them and pray, Father, that as we enter this new year, that you would again enter us with all power and with all praise for you, that we might, as Noah was, obedient to your commands. All of these things we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. God bless you.